Hi everyone. I want to start off my talk today about the human mind portrayed through art by sharing a quick anecdote. So when I was in high school, I took an AP Psych class. And one day in this class, our teacher brought in two things that were borrowed from a medical lab in a nearby university to surprise us with. When class started, he had us all put on latex gloves and walk up to the front of the class. When he took the lids off the containers and exposed what was inside, almost the whole class started laughing. People said it was gross, disgusting, walked back to their desks. Although most of my classmates had really adverse reactions to the contents of the bins, I was really excited about what I saw inside. I reached inside the first bin and I lifted up the first item, a spinal cord. I held it in my hands. I looked at it with awe thinking, Nothing could possibly top this. It was just so incredible to me. And then I peered into the bin next to it. And inside this bin was an intact, donated human brain. At this point, none of my classmates wanted anything to do with it. And I couldn't understand why anyone, especially psychology students, could be so grossed out by such a fascinating aspect of human life. While I held this brain in my hands, I thought about all of the things that this organ's capable of how it belonged to someone at a point in time not too long ago. It was filled with their thoughts, their emotions, all their memories. It encompassed all of the human experience, yet it fit into this simple three pound organ. It was easily one of the most pivotal moments in my life. So I couldn't understand why anyone would willingly set out an opportunity like that. But I realized later on that everybody's unique and that everyone goes through a moment like that sometime in their life just maybe not through their experience of holding a brain in their hands. For others, their philosophical moment might have been brought to them through a film, music, or literature. While all of these vessels describe the human experience and definitely have great displays of it, I think that if you want something second best holding a brain in your hands, analyzing art is about as close as you can get. Art displays so many aspects of psychology, the complexity of the human mind, and the nuances of the experiences that we all endure. The beginnings of what's well known as a humanistic psychology starts in ancient Greece in the early 6th century BC. Ancient Greek culture was incredibly humanistic. Everything in their culture was humanity-centered. Even Greek gods were human-like. They had desires, urges, and weaknesses. The first visual depiction of this humanistic individualized psychology was known as the archaic smile shown on many sculptures throughout archaic Greece. There's an archaic smile shown on this marble head of Akuros, shown by a subtle smile with upturned lips. It appears unnatural and slightly unsettling, sort of mannequin-like, but many people believe that this just shows blind happiness, when in reality, it's actually showing a representation that the figure has the capability to experience emotion in general, and that there's a mind-body connection involved in the figure. This obviously shows an individual psychology and also the start of a humanistic psychology in artistic depictions. The old market woman is a marble Hellenistic sculpture displaying a struggling old woman crouched over. The face of the old market woman has this depressing, tired eyes, deep wrinkles, and a thin, sunken in frail appearance. Instead of showing traditional beauty, the old market woman shows a strong sense of sadness, subjective signs of mental illness, and discomfort all of which show the intricate detail of the psychology of this figure. We see her crouched over with a hunched back. She's struggling to carry the basket and overall load she's taking on. She looks disheveled, her clothes are falling off of her, exposing her body. She seems like she's lost and confused and is both physically and mentally exhausted. While all of this is very important, with time, this view of humanistic psychology grows stronger and we see better depictions of individual psychology along with a new focus of the addition of group psychology as well. Flash forward about 20 centuries, we enter an era that is very important for its displays of psychology, emotion, and realism. In the 19th century, we see the true beginnings of the science of psychology with Wilhelm Wundt being the first person to create a psychology lab. Prior to the 1800s, anybody who studied psychology did it in more of a philosophical sense, not exactly in a legitimate scientific nature. Along with that, in the 19th century, romanticism began with a focus on the sublime, suffering, and the human experience. The romantic had many famous artists like Francisco de Goya, 
Caspar David Friedrich, and Theodore Gericault, all of which will be influential in our discussion of the mind portrayed through art. For example, Goya's Madhouse painting was done between 1812 and 1819, based around the Zaragoza Mental Asylum, an asylum Goya visited while in Spain. This scene is chaotic and unsettling, portrayed by the dark, gritty look to the painting, with harsh, unsettling contrasts between the lit center of the image and the shadowy area off to the right. The figures in the madhouse are all patients in the asylum, each with different body languages and potentially a unique form of mental illness as well. While most of the figures are alone and are isolated, there are some patients shown interacting with others, such as the ones off to the right, seemingly involved in a sexual encounter. All of the different facial expressions, behaviors, and appearances contribute to the displays of individual psychology. They are all shown as mentally ill asylum patients suffering from insanity, so a combined group psychology is there. However, they all show different facial expressions and individual psychology as well. All the figures in the painting are shown with little dignity. They're shown either partially or fully nude and with crazed expressions on their faces. At the time the painting was created in the early 1800s, there was a lot of confusion around what to do with people that were mentally ill. In many mental institutions or asylums as they were called back then, mental patients were treated very, very poorly. There was not a wide understanding yet of psychology and more specifically about mental disorders. Only a few years following Madhouse, the Madhouse painting by Goya, psychiatrist Etienne Jean Jordet asked Theodore Gericault to do these paintings in an attempt to categorize clinical models of psychological disorders. Georgette believed that the mentally ill were sick and that they needed help, not to be shunned and excluded from society. This is a huge turning point in the ways that people and society viewed mentally ill individuals. Prior to the 19th century, people viewed most physical and mental illnesses as a result of God's wrath. Many people have discussed and researched the theological context of mental illness historically, and I won't be covering that today. However, American revolutionary Thomas Paine makes a wonderful point by saying that the belief in a cruel God makes a cruel man. In the midst of the Enlightenment, mindsets were starting to change towards more scientific explanations for everything, including mental illness. The ideology of connecting God's wrath and sin to mental illness was a major contributor in the long-lasting harmful stigmas surrounding mental illness. In these paintings, Jericho shows the realism of the individual's suffering with tiny details in their facial expressions, like the glints in their eyes, or a slight frown or wrinkle between the eyebrows, all while giving respect to them at the same time. There were 10 asylum pa paintings originally, and there are only five remaining. The individuals are shown fully clothed and not in ragged old clothes either, but most likely in the clothes that they were wearing when they were admitted into the asylum. While yes, these individuals look less than pleased to be <laughs> the models for these paintings, Jericho gave the patients a sense of dignity and respect that was rarely seen in depictions of the mentally ill at this time. As opposed to the respectable displays of the mentally ill Jericho just showed us, he also did other works that were more dark and displayed some taboos like cannibalism and his raft of the Medusa, or in this case, a polyamorous sexual encounter. Three Lovers is Jericho's only known erotic work. There are two female figures, the brunette on the left shown fully nude, resting and gazing up at the other two intertwined lovers. The woman on the right is semi-clothed, but her white dress is being pulled up, exposing the backs of her thighs and even higher up. It's ironic that Our Lady in White is shown in such a manner when the color white is typically connected to purity and innocence, that the scene is not exactly virtuous. The man in the painting is barely displayed at all, covered by the shadow of the woman he's embracing. All we can really see of the man is the muscular legs, a shadowy face, along with his hands and arms wrapped around Our Lady in White. There's also a Caravaggio-esque chiaroscuro in the image because of the singular light source, which adds a sense of drama to the scene. There is an evident focus on the women in the scene, of course, especially on the voluptuous curves in their bodies. The nude brunette mirrors figures like Titian's Venus of Urbino and Goya's Maha Desnuda. Along with this, we can see a sculpture in the upper left. This dark figure is most likely the goddess of love, desire, and sex, known as Venus or Aphrodite. The goddess sculpture encourages the sensual activities being displayed and adds to the overt erotic tones in the painting. This scene breaks not only the norms for Jericho, who is probably best known for his portrayals of war and horses, but also for the time of society. Three lovers deviates from the standard and explores a female-centered sexual taboo. While group sex has existed since the Paleolithic, 
it is still seen to this day as something taboo in most cultures and societies. At the time in France, as Catholicism was the primary religion, they would certainly frown upon such outward displays of debauchery. As opposed to the three lovers and the obvious eroticism and intimacy involved in this scene, a walk at dusk is all about loneliness and isolation. I wanted to make a point that psychology isn't always just shown in somebody's facial expression or the objective involvement in an asylum patient portrayal. It can also be shown in suffering, in emotions, and even displayed in landscapes and symbolism. For example, in this painting by Caspar David Friedrich, along with most of his other works, there's a lonesome figure that cannot we can't make out his facial expression. You would think this would mean there's no subjectivity or that, that there's no psychology involved or that it's all up to subjectivity to explain what's happening in the scene. However, things as small as the environment can provide a glimpse into the mood and into the emotion of the piece. There's a man shown in isolation and contemplation in front of a megalithic tomb. There are dead barren trees, there's no foliage, and there's a crescent moon in the hazy lavender sky. It's obviously winter time, and the man is bundled up in a warm coat and hat. The man is looking down and standing at the foot of this grave. He has his hands clasped together in possible prayer or just in contemplation, but based off the death motif in the barren environment, we can infer that he might be contemplating his own mortality. On the topic of death and grief, the next painting I will cover is called War Pieta, done by Max Ginsburg. The artist of this painting, Max Ginsburg, directly explained what his motivations were for each of his works. Regarding this piece, War Pieta, he said he wanted to bring attention to the horrors of war and more specifically, the horrors of the war in Iraq. This piece helps show one of the most difficult emotions that humans deal with, grief. The torn uniform, the amputations, the wide array of injuries, all on top of the crumpled American flag, represent the loss of many young Americans who've been killed in the war in the Middle East. The mother was made to be a woman of middle age in similar appearance to the Madonna of Michelangelo's Pieta, hence the brown shawl the woman's wearing. Ginsburg's goal was to display this mother grieving over her military son in the same way that Mary grieved the loss of Christ. Another tie to the Renaissance is with this golden sky. Infiltrating this golden horizon are the black smoke clouds of the burning oil field lit up by fires in the distance. The dead soldier has bloody wounds all over his body. He's wrapped in gauze around his abdomen. His head and his face are dripping in blood, soaking through the medical garments. Both his right arm and leg are amputated as well, symbolizing the multiple losses that soldiers deal with, whether that be psychological or physical injuries or a combination of both. The brutality and gore seen in this image add to the realism and help add strong emotion to the scene. This bloody image is not meant to shock the viewers, but more so to help allow viewers to experience the pain and suffering that both figures feel in the painting. We see the soldier's mother screaming in agony while holding her son's corpse. Her facial expression is so raw and detailed it's almost like we can hear her screams. War Pieta is gritty, gory, and real. The emotion in the scene is so palpable and is an incredible example of how art can describe the human experience and the human mind in a very unique way. Alongside this, I was lucky enough to interview an art history professor at UW Milwaukee, Michael Ashenberg. He gave me a lot of insight on the next piece I will be going over and gave me a great quote to finish off for Pieta with. Mr. Ashenberg said in our interview that for artists, there was a real challenge to represent the mental state visually. I feel like Ginsburg does a great job showing the interior emotional state of this grieving mother in an outward way. It allows us to almost peer into her mind for a moment while analyzing the art. Another interesting piece of art that displays raw emotion, suffering, and inner demons is the Isenheim altarpiece, done by Matthias Grunewald. The Isenheim altarpiece was made for the Isenheim Monastery, which at the time was essentially a hospital for sufferers of St. Anthony's Fire or ergotism. St. Anthony's Fire resulted in victims having hallucinations, intense burning pain, lesions all over the body, and gangrene of feet, hands, and even whole limbs, resulting in amputations. This altarpiece was meant to aid in the comfort of the patients by showing the intense suffering of biblical figures leading to their joy. This is an image of the exterior of the altarpiece. The exterior shows on each side the two plagues, St. Sebastian and St. Anthony. Sebastian is the embodiment of psychological, physical suffering, while St. Anthony shows a focus on the psychological suffering, which is more important for our purposes today. 
The exterior shows a brutal crucifixion scene in the center with an inky black backdrop and scale hierarchy to amplify the emotional and the psychological turmoil. Christ is off-center, which is not usual for any religious scenes with him involved. The center of the painting symbolically amputates Christ's arm, which is symbolic also for the sufferers of St. Anthony's fire dealing with amputations themselves. Historically, crucifixion is seen as one of the most brutal and degrading executions known to man. The goal was to increase agony in the body and to humiliate the victim at the same time. Asphyxiation was the cause of death in crucifixion, and that's shown here by the contortions of the rib cage and the abdominal muscles. As Christ is trying to pull himself up with all the strength to get another full breath. There's also intense anatomical accuracy in the scene with Christ's pale greenish body, the blue lips and eyelids showing his lack of adequate oxygen. There's also whip wounds and there are thorns crushed off the top of his head and shown all over his body. There's also pustules on his body, another nod to St. Anthony's fire. And we can even see graphic details like the nerve spasms in his fingers. The graphic imagery did serve a purpose, however to equate Christ's agony to the suffering of the patients at the monastery. The first opening would be displayed on Christian Sabbath and symbolizes hope showing Christ's resurrection. As opposed to the brutal pain shown on the exterior, the first opening shows joy and glory following suffering. On the left is the Annunciation, in the center is the birth of Christ, and on the right is Christ's resurrection. In the center of the scene, there are Hieronymus Bosch inspired celestial beings, there are angels playing music, and everyone has these vivid orbs of light around their heads. These orbs were a nod to the hallucinogenic symptoms of St. Anthony's fire, because these people were dealing with not only physical agony, but psychological torment as well. They were afraid of what would happen to them, if they would live or if they would die, and I'm sure they had a lot of confusion regarding these hallucinations that they were experiencing as well. To try and provide some comfort to these individuals, the Antonine monks told them that the reason they were seeing these auras and hallucinations was because they were on the verge of heaven. At a very basic level, this is one of the first ways that we started to implement therapy into our modern world via medical professionals comforting individuals when they know that there's nothing they can do to help the physical ailments, but that they can try and give them a sense of peace and serenity before they pass away. On the right in the resurrection scene, there is a large dominant orb of light surrounding Christ, and his face is almost being fused into this bright light. This is, of course, a nod to the hallucinogenic auras, but it's also symbolic of the light of Christ penetrating the darkness, showing that pain and suffering turns into joy and glory, a symbol of hope for the St. Anthony's fire sufferers. The second opening would be displayed only on the Feast of St. Anthony and Sebastian. The shrine in the center was the focus of the entire altarpiece and was built by Nicholas Hagenau. The paintings on each side of the shrine depict scenes from St. Anthony's life. On the left, we see loneliness and isolation, and on the right, we see demons tormenting him. In the center is the golden shrine, prompting joy and celebration. This is something common in later psychological developments, utilizing the ideology of struggles leading to personal growth. While the Isenheim altarpiece focuses on religious themes, the connections to not only mental illness with the hallucin hallucinations, suffering, depression, confusion, anxiety, all of it's really important in understanding the involvement of art in the history of psychology. For me, the biggest takeaway from this piece was the fact that a painting had this huge aid in easing these victims' minds before they pass is a really touching thing. I think it shows not only the importance of art historically, but it also shows how art is more than just a pretty picture on the wall for people to enjoy. There is a quote I found during my research on this altarpiece that goes, art and painting bring the freedom that we find only a little in our exchanges and more in our silences. The freedom to contemplate and love the forbidden, the freedom to appreciate the odd, the unknown, the ugly, the naked and life and death in a whole new way without ever having to justify it. That's how it is. Art offers us, us the possibility of exaltation in front of the unbearable, superb pain, the light which cannot live without its share of shadow. The dark, taboo, and unsettling depictions in the works I've shown you all today may not seem like things that should be praised, 
but they certainly have a strong appeal to them, and there are many meaningful reasons that people are drawn to these works. While insanity, deviance, and suffering should definitely not be romanticized or sensationalized, these depictions have positively impacted people all over the world from all different cultures and time periods by allowing them to experience the darkness in humanity and in ourselves.